Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have on the speaker's life, Sonia Piontek. Sonia Piontek is a keynote speaker on unleashing potential and ultra creativity. During her years as marketing director for BMW Asia, Sonia was responsible for the brand strategy and marketing activities across Asia, including the introduction of the BMW brand into new markets. Today, we're not inspiring audiences. You'll find her traveling the world, taking photographs, or helping businesses build their brands through a consulting firm, Son and & Kind. And it's my great pleasure to have Sonia with us today. So welcome, Sonia. Hey, James, great to be here with you. So share with us all what's happening in your world at the moment. Well, first of all, it's been the most incredible journey, something I could not have dreamed of when I left BMW. I mean, obviously coming um, from such a comfortable life, being the marketing director for BMW in Asia, um, to, to leave that world was quite a big step for me. And as I started considering that step outside my comfort zone, a lot of people actually told me, no, 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 you're not going to leave BMW. You're not going to leave that career. And it took me a few months to actually get to terms with that decision and gather the guts to step outside that very, very comfortable comfort zone and start up um, a totally new life. And the last two years have just been phenomenal. So uh, you take us back a little bit, you know, uh, how long were you at BMW uh, before you kind of left and kind of went on to do your own thing? And, and did you always kind of come from this world of branding and marketing? Was that what you were kind of trained yeah. in initially? Well, the funny thing is I'm originally from Munich, the hometown of BMW, but I did not start my BMW career in Munich. I actually started my career with BMW in New Zealand, the furthest <laughs> possible part in the world. So I started in New Zealand um, as the, um, uh, the events and CRM manager many, many years ago. I then worked for BMW in various different roles in different countries, always on the marketing side in a lot of strategic roles. Like my, my last big role in Germany was, um, I was the head of naming and branding for the BMW group globally. An amazing job where I sort of learned a lot about um, brand strategy, about naming strategy, about a lot what, of, of visionary topics that were happening within the BMW group globally. Fantastic job. And that was before I came to Singapore as the um, director of marketing for the Asian region. And that obviously was an absolute dream come true. Being responsible for one of the mo world's most prestigious brands in one of the most amazing, fastest growing um, vibrant, vibrant regions of the world. Um, that was just, it, it was too good to be true in a way. But at some point, I just got this feeling of there's got to be more in it for me in my life in terms of unleashing my own potential, doing more things that I really deeply, deeply care for. And whilst building a brand and creating unforgettable experiences for customers has always been something that really drove me. It was sort of, it came to a point where I said, I really want to want to just do the things I personally care for. And I want to do them in a way where I'm not slowed down by politics, by structures, by, by things that just happen in big organizations. And I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean, a huge organization like BMW only works because there are so many structures, there are so many discussions, there are so many meetings and so many people involved. But I just, I wanted to, to move things quicker, to be more impactful and to really do things where I could add tremendous value in relatively short time also. So that's when I left BMW. I started off um, um, setting up my own agency and it's called Sonnenkind, which basically means child of the sun. And it's the, it's the nickname my dad used to give me when I was a kid. Very, <laughs> very positive. And it, 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 was, it was a bit of payback time and to say thank you to my dad for a lot of things. So as I called my first company Sonnenkind, which in English also is quite nice, Zon and Kind, sounds quite okay. And what we do with, with Zon and Kind is we basically create incredible um, tours to the most amazing countries like Mongolia, like New Zealand, like Nepal. And we take brands and their most VIP or most treasured customers on these tours 
And the whole idea is to turn customers into total fans of those brands, be it for brands like Land Rover, Lamborghini, the cycle and carriage brand, or I also do a lot of work for Leica camera. It's, it's the most amazing, stunning tours, but we're not a travel agent. We're a true brand building um, agency that fully understands the power of brand building and the power um, customers have and the revenue customers give you once you've managed to turn, turn them into fans. So that is something I've, I've, I've just always been passionate about. And now I can actually make money creating those incredible experiences for top-notch brands worldwide. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And in terms of this, this, you know, this passion that you have for unleashing potential, not just in yourself, but in others and in, in, in organizations as well, there's obviously so many different ways that you could do that, you know, speaking and writing, yeah, experiential you know, workshops. There's, there's so many different ways you could, you could do that. What made you decide on the, the kind of, I guess, the, the delivery modes that you decided on, which is around, definitely around the speaking and those kind of exper the experiential side? The experiential side, setting up that agency, basically, it, it just came naturally. I left BMW a week later. Um, one of my, my um, friends here in Singapore asked me, well, can you please help me? I want to take this trip to Europe with my entire family. And we just want something special. I don't just want to book yet another boring holiday. Can you create a special experience? And I'd done a lot of those specially curated VIP trips for BMW during my time. I set up the, the largest um, driving activity outside of headquarters. So this came naturally. And the speaking, funnily enough, I'd, I'd started doing a few keynote speeches sort of in my last year at BMW. But very clearly, they were not really interested in me. They were interested in the marketing director of BMW Asia. That was all it was about. So they booked me. I went on stage. I delivered. And when I left BMW, my feeling was that, Obviously, I'm not going to get booked again. But funny enough, they all kept calling me again. And they were like, Sonia, can you come to this and that event? Can you come to our conference? We would like you on stage. And I said, guys, nice. Thank you for calling. But I'm no longer with BMW. You can't put the title on your, on your invitation. And sort of, and they were like, no, but we, we don't care about your title. We care about you. And I'm like, well, hang on, hang on. What do you mean? But I'm no longer the director of marketing. They're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. We want you on stage because we loved what you did and we want you on stage. We want you to inspire our audiences. So I was totally taken. Um, I, I really didn't expect it. So I'm like, oh, wow. Well, if they really want me, then I, I, I'll come. I, I'll go on stage and I'll, I'll share my message. So I started, uh, well, I continued um, doing my keynote speeches. Obviously, in the beginning, a lot of those were on brand building, how to actually create true return on investment through a different kind of marketing, not just the boring old stuff, but really new creative ideas. But then as I, as I kept doing those and as I kept getting, getting feedback from audiences, the one thing I, I kept hearing over and over again is how I was able to touch people and to deeply inspire them. And it got me thinking that the inspiration was probably not so much the marketing content, the brand building content, but it was my way of thinking. And I spoke to a few people um, in the audience that had given me that feedback and they were all like, the way you think is so different. The way that you triggered something in us is so powerful that we just want to do things differently now. And that was how I got into motivational speaking. And very quickly afterwards, I had sort of done my first speeches on what I called SOAR, because you can, simply because it was part of my story to unleash my own potential, to, to sort of tap into my, my, my strength and, and, and just let out what, was, what had always been there. And within for another half a year or so, I kept getting, getting booked a lot more for my motivational speeches. And it's, it's so much more rewarding even than the brand building. Because in a way, the brand building is a lovely technical, technical um, skill. And I can, I can definitely inspire people to do things differently and to come up with totally new ideas. But when you, when you talk about unleashing potential, unlocking ultra creativity in people, 
it is so much more powerful. And I've, I've, just, I've just enjoyed this journey so much, being able to inspire people, being able to help them be open for change, have an agile mindset, and just tap into their ultra creativity that I deeply believe every single one of us has, if only we would start to allow it. And I think that journey that you went on of obviously when you initially started speaking, speaking on the, the topic that was, was your kind of job title that you obviously had real strong domain mm. expertise, but then gradually over time kind of finding and feeling your way, actually, what, what do I resonate with as a topic? What is the audience resonating with? I think it's actually a very common thing. And I think it's actually quite a, it's quite a good way to do it because it allows you to get out there to start building your craft as a speaker, getting those, that experience oh, of getting in front of audience and, and having a sense of confidence that, okay, you might be learning different things in terms of technically as, as a speaker, but the actual content you feel solid on. And then gradually over time, you start to make yourself uh, a little bit more uncomfortable, push yourself into new places with the, with the actual topic. You live in Singapore. Now that, that's a city, a country where you have so many different speakers in that small country of 6 million people. Um, yes. and, and I often think when I travel there, I think it's both, both a wonderful thing and also almost a bit of a curse as well because you, you're in a very competitive space geographically there as well, but it also gives you the ability to be able to see lots of different types of speakers who have very different types of business models. And as you were kind of looking at your members of your community of, of fellow, fellow speakers, were there, were there particular speakers, either in Singapore or speakers around the world, that you said, that's the kind of, either the, the kind of speaker I want to be, or that's the kind of um, speaking business that I want to build, or that's the way that I want to build my own speaking business? Well, um, what you said about Singapore is definitely true. I mean, there's a, there's a huge um, speaker, speaker community, which is beautiful in, in many ways because you've got a lot of people you can mingle with. You've got a lot of people you can learn from, but you can also share your learnings with. But obviously also you've got a lot of um, in-house competition in a way. Um, what I did from a very early um, stage of my speaking is... I, I basically, I never had this one speaker where I said, oh, one day I want to be like such and such. But I, I allowed other speakers to deeply touch me and inspire me. I technically, obviously, learned from various speakers. I had a look at different, or I'm, I, I still am looking at different um, business setups that, that different speakers have. And sometimes you come across um, speakers where you say, hey, great, um, it works for you. It certainly wouldn't, wouldn't be what I would want to do. Um, one thing, for example, that, that really surprised me, um, that, um, the denomination, um, CSP for me was sort of the, the top notch speakers, but the way you can earn that, that title is basically through a rather rigid, um, number of like you need to have a certain amount of income plus a certain uh, number of speeches but it turns out that most of the um the title holders in singapore are actually predominantly trainers hmm. so that was something that i was actually quite shocked about because for me it was sort of like that that mega title for speakers but then most of them are actually predominantly trainers um and that's something where i said okay so that is actually part of that industry as well where for me, it was really in the beginning only, if I'm talking about a speaking career, I want to make this a speaking career. And yes, I also do some trainings, I, I do some coaching, but for me, 80, 90% of my speaking career actually needs to be speaking. Yeah. And that's and so something you, that I have defined for myself. And I, and I think that's, I mean, that's interesting. People come at it from, uh, from, from different perspectives. And one thing I'm wondering is, obviously, when I came into speaking, I had background in things like online marketing and so that's even though i don't speak about online marketing it gave me a little bit of an edge in relation to other speakers that weren't mm. perhaps as comfortable with online marketing and digital marketing now i would say one of your edges not just one but one of your edges is around branding you have you understand it at a very deep level you've done it at a very very high level and so i'm wondering as you were starting to think about yourself as a brand i don't want to have um 
uh, a sense of brandeur here or anything as well, but you put yourself into the third person. But at the same time, you would have been looking, be able to see around lots of different speakers and see what some speakers were doing right around branding and some speakers weren't perhaps doing quite as well. What did you decide to do for your, your own branding? How do you think about your own brand as a speaker? Mm. Um, very vital point. Um, and I'm glad that you start, um, start talking about it because what a lot of people do, they're sort of very concerned about getting their, their keynote right, getting their topics sorted out, getting possibly their, their niche um, sorted out, which already is a big step. But what most speakers um, don't really understand is the power of a professionally set up premium brand. And I was just giving a speech in India last week, actually, about um, building premium brands in the digital age, what it takes, what it means, and why it is so important to do. I mean, if you want to play on the top, you really have to set up your brand properly, professionally, and you have to set up a premium brand. And that's something that obviously with my background, for me, it was, it was something so easy to do because I'd been doing it all my life. But when you then see how some, some of the speakers, even established speakers, totally struggle with it, um, it got me to a point where I said, you know what, I'm actually also going to start offering branding services simply because I see there's so much need. So we've now created a service called the Brand Aficionado, aficionado standing for someone deeply passionate as well as knowledgeable about a topic. So the brand aficionado, we basically help aspiring speakers as well as established speakers and trainers and, and other businesses to build professionally build their premium brands. And sometimes it's, it's, it comes down to simple things like getting the corporate identity right. What does that mean? Like basically having the, the, the rules, um, in, with what you communicate, like what colors do you use? What font do you use? What's your tonality? What's your visual language? And it's, I mean, even just going to that, through that, those steps of thinking about it. What color language do I want to use? What visuals do I want to use? A lot of people just do what they feel like at the very moment, but to systematically and strategically set that up will set your brand apart. And it's, it's beautiful to see how with a few little pieces and, and, and a few sort of the basics, how much difference it already makes. And what was your thinking, a brand like, say, BMW, it, it sits in a position, it's, a, it's an aspirational brand, it's, it's, it's a luxury uh, brand as well, but at the same time, it's a consumer-focused brand. So I'm wondering about mm. your own, what you, you do on the topic of unleashing potential, because... In one, if you first hear that, that can feel like a very direct to consumer. I could imagine, you know, a, a speaker speaking around that topic to, you know, Tony Robbins style, very consumer focused. But then your background is having deep, a deep understanding of those, that corporate market and understanding yeah. that kind of higher end market. So how did you decide, because unleashing potential in, in deciding which market did you want to serve first? What was your thinking yeah. around that? So a market that works extremely well for me and where I get most of my bookings is obviously the corporate world. What they um, appreciate a lot is the fact that I understand them. I speak their language. Um, if, when I meet the, uh, a board member to pre-discuss and align on the keynote, on the objectives, on the challenges they are facing, they immediately understand that I understand them. And I've had it so often, these discussions where they, they just look at me and go like, okay, you've been in similar situations before, you know how the corporate world works. And it's extremely helpful for them to be able to speak with a speaker and brief a speaker that understands their world, that understands their challenges, and that knows how to solve them and how to craft a keynote that will then fully support um, their objectives. And that's something where whilst yes i obviously talk to the individual and help the individual unleash their potential in the end i really help the organizations increase profitability um, have much better working teams and have teams that trust themselves to achieve totally new heights so whilst 
it seems like my end client is the, the individual audience member. It's really the corporates um, in their strategic objectives. And I, coming from that background, fully understand what they need in order to reach those object objectives. So it's really, for me, the corporate world that works best. And it's interesting, as you say that, and I'm, I'm suddenly reminded of another great speaker, Sally Hogshead, who came from albeit the world of advertising. That was her world in kind of New York advertising. And she knew very well the, what the thinking was in terms of brand managers and, and, and marketing mm. direct. She, she knew that language instinctively. And when she decided to become that speaker on topic around branding, which like fascination, she knew the lingo. She knew the language so well. Mm. They, they felt like, I'm not just speaking, I'm not just having a conversation as a discovery call with um, a speaker. I'm actually having it with someone who really has felt my pain, <laughs> has, has oh, experienced absolutely. that as well. And that's a very different type of conversation that you have on a discovery call. Yeah, and I had that so often also in, um, in discussions with very high ranking managers, board members, where for example, the team was like, oh yeah, yeah, no, we don't have any challenges in the team. It's all good. We just want to have a bit more motivation. And the moment the, the, um, the board member, for example, stepped in, they looked at me, they said, she speaks our language. We need to be open. We've got massive challenges. These are our challenges. Keep them, keep them to yourself, obviously. But this is exactly what we, what we struggle with at the moment. But I also asked the right questions because I could just walk in and say okay let me do my motivational bit and let me just sort of get a few laughs and get people motivated a little bit but that's not what I want what I want is I really want to help them reach their objectives and help their, their employees um, become part of the process and part of the team hmm. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very powerful value proposition uh, going to a client and having, having that type of discussion. And I'm wondering, as you're, you're talking with all these clients now, for a speaker on the topics that you, that you speak on, what are mm -hmm. those kind of key challenges that you're hearing time and time again from those clients? Because if, if you work with different types of speakers, often they, when they're working with clients, they're hearing like three or four key challenges coming up time mm -hmm. and time again. What are those for you than the clients you work with? Um, quite often it's the... The lack um, or the yeah no, the lack in in employees to be open for change. Um, so what I can really help with is opening up for a more change focused mindset, having a more agile mindset because a lot of lot of organizations are struggling with huge technology changes, with huge um, internal. Um, restructurings and from for most employees and i can totally relate to it they've been in certain positions for 10 sometimes 15 years and all of a sudden someone is shaking shaking on their chair and going like hey dude why don't you move somewhere else why don't you do things differently now and people are scared so quite often the discussion is around can you please help help us make our teams or our employees more more agile in their in their thinking more open towards change so that's that's a very very big topic in many of the of the um of the corporate clients i deal with now you're a speakers you member as well and usually the uh, when i'm working with speakers who have been speaking for a while um the, the two questions i normally ask them is uh, which of your speeches, because they might have multiple speeches at that point, mm -hmm. is the one that you're getting booked for, or is, or is almost like, is, is the easiest thing to book. You can book it, you know, clients just would just happily book it day in, day out. And then the second question I usually ask is, what is your number one lead source? How are people finding out about your offer, your brand, your, your keynotes, and wh which ones is really con converting best? So on that second question, someone, the, the journey that you're on, and also someone that has a very strong experience in understanding marketing, what are the 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 uh, the marketing channels that you're finding is currently working best for you? Um, LinkedIn works really well for me. Um, personal recommendation is probably my number one source still, um, and um, the whole area of um, full on online marketing is something I I understand. I need to milk a lot better so the first two years after bmw i was i was so busy running my agency that i simply did not have enough or i didn't put in enough time into properly setting up my my 
marketing my back end sales and marketing for my speaking career. Um, also because it just, the gigs just came coming in so nicely that I slightly neglected that part of the business. And I've only just started properly professionally setting up my speaking business as a business. Um, I've got two ladies from the Philippines now working, um, working 24 seven on this topic with me. And we are just sort of setting it all up at, as we speak, basically. And what was with your a lot of earnings, and it's yeah. something to be honest. Whew, yeah, I mean, that, there that, are some fields that, that are, yeah, interesting. Yeah, that, that step of actually, I know a lot of uh, our speakers, you members, um, they they often very quickly they'll bring on a a, a, a virtual assistant, a VA, or uh, whether it's from the Philippines or or somewhere in the world, just to start to kind of leverage. Uh, their time mm. a little bit better. So, and and we hear I hear lots of different uh, experiences from that. And obviously, I try to provide kind of guidance on on that side as well. But what has been what has been your experience of doing that? And you obviously you live in Asia, you're very familiar with yeah. the culture as well. But uh, there's always teething <laughs> challenges. So, so what has been yeah. your experience yeah. of working with VAs? Um, first of all, I don't call them VAs because mine are a lot more than just assistants. Um, mine are full on employees that deliver on a very high level. It took me a lot of time to find them. Um, I didn't just sort of reach out to the first, first one that sounded okay. I allowed for about three, four months for every single one of them to find the right person. I then, what I also do, um, the moment I, I had them on board, I flew them to Singapore for, for a one week onboarding which proved to be highly, highly um, efficient. Because also, I mean, if you just have a virtual assistant that, that helps you with some calendar bookings and sort of does some research with you, for you, fine. But I wanted them to be full members of the team to fully understand why we're doing it, how we're doing it. So I, I invest a lot of time in them. And we've become a very close team. And every two, three months, I um, host a, we call it the boot camp, simply because we all get together and we just work 24-7 on, on the latest topics. And that is something which is extremely valuable um, for um, the progress of the business, um, for the team spirit. But obviously, it also costs a lot of money to do these things. And it's something where if you want to do it right, you've just got to invest that kind of money. So my experiences with my team has been fantastic, but I've also heard a lot of horror stories from people that didn't go through that um, filtering process in the beginning, that didn't do the onboarding, that don't, don't invest in actually meeting their teams, and that, that don't spend the time in working together with their teams. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I, mean, I, I certainly found that with the team. I think all, all of our team members have been with us over three years now some of them have been with us for five years as well and it's definitely it's a building that relationship and the thing i often find very interesting working uh, uh, with assistants if i'm not physically in the same place as them is that the, that role of the the coach or the mentor to that employee uh, mm. has, has a slightly different flavor to it than if you were actually sitting across from each other every oh, totally, day as well totally. and what I, I personally find very rewarding in that and, and i think this is where when, uh, it's great to hear that you've, you've had a fantastic experience working uh, with your build, putting that team together because that's not always the case. And sometimes when I hear that they, it hasn't been the case that they've had a good experience, it's because they've, they've assumed that one assistant or one assistant can do everything, <laughs> the social media, yeah. the, you know, every, everything possible, rather than thinking, actually, this is something they're going to have a core set of skills, but I really want to invest in that person. And as you say, what you're about, which is un unleash the potential of that team member. Yeah, and, and another thing that I always teach or talk about during my talks is focus on, focus on strength. I mean, there's certain things that, that my two ladies are absolute shit at. There's certain things I'm absolute shit at. Like, and I would never force someone to do something they're not good at. For me, it's always, okay, what are you good at? What are you passionate about? Where can you create the biggest value? If I force a super creative person to sit down and fill an Excel list with 5,000 um, bits of information, that person is only going to fail and be unhappy. 
and I'll still have to pay for it and get, <laughs> get a crap result. So for me, it's always been see and talk openly. And that's something I always do, talk openly about the topics people are dealing with. And I always ask them, is that something you feel comfortable with? Is that something you're good, good at? And or can we spread it in the team differently? I mean, certain things just have to be done. If we need to do a translation into German, I mean, it's me because I'm the only one that speaks German. And sometimes it's... <sighs> It annoys me if I do a speaker information pack and then uh, a bureau in Germany says, oh, can we have it in German, please? And I know that I'm the one that has to then translate it unless I give it to someone else. But yeah, but for me, generally, with 80% of the tasks, focus on the, on the strength and get people to do things they're good at and passionate about because that way you get most amazing results. And then you're obviously part of that that community of speakers in Singapore. There's APS there as well, which is a great organization. Um, what's the best piece of advice that you've received about building a life and a career as a professional speaker? Um, I think I think the best piece of advice or the, the, the biggest wow moment for me was when very early into my speaking, well, I wouldn't call it career then, sort of after I'd left BMW and got my first two, three gigs of being on stage without actually considering myself a speaker um, or without knowing what this whole world was all about, somehow, and I can't even remember how, I got invited to an APSS meeting and all of a sudden there were all these speakers and all these super nice people and and all of a sudden I realized, wow, there's people who actually live off being a speaker and it's a full on profession. And there was something, I mean, obviously, you know, the Tony Robbins is, and of the world, but that there are so many people who, who create an amazing career around it was something I was, I was just stunned by. And that was the first time that I thought, wow, this is actually a great thing that, that I could do as well and that I actually want to do as well. So this was where that moment when whilst I had already set up my agency, I also thought, I also want to be a professional speaker. And that, that moment was so powerful. And I started like within the next week, I'd set up my, my first website of Zonia Piontek uh, as a speaker. And it just, it developed from there. And I, I then took it obviously quite seriously to set up a proper speaker brand and not just sort of fiddle around and, and see where this was going, but to just properly set it up and, and be taken seriously. And within the first year of being a, a speaker, I had a lot of global gigs. I mean, I even spoke in the Allianz Arena in Munich. I mean, in an arena me, non-football, have never been to the <laughs> arena. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm walking into the arena and I'm the big speaker there on stage. I mean, if you do it right, these things are possible. And it's interesting because I remember when you, you got that, that opportunity and you know, I'm having conversations about how to take advantage of a great opportunity like that, where you're in a, an yes. amazing venue like that. What, what advice uh, would you give to someone if, let's say, they, they get the opportunity to go speak on a great stage? Well, it doesn't have to be in a, uh, an arena. It could be just a really nice space um, that is going to look really good. What, what advice would you give to that? Speaker? Okay, there's just one thing to say. Get professional photography and videography. That's the only thing. I mean, yes, you've got to nail it content-wise. You've got to be doing all the other things and bits and pieces right. But for, for a venue like this, I employed my own photographer and I had a team of three people taking videos. And that is, I mean, just the photos that we took during that speech are worth so much in terms of positioning me as a, as a premium top-notch speaker globally. So get the right photography and videography. Now, you're a very experienced traveler. You travel to all these wonderful yes. places around the world. <laughs> you take people to these wonderful places around the world. So I'm, I'm wondering, what is in your speaker bag? What is in that bag that you carry with you to all of your various speaking engagements that you never leave home without? Okay, my, my, my sort of pre-packed little remover has a lot of little gadgets, but they're not very fancy. And I say that, without being ashamed because one thing i have learned the best camera is not the fancy one it's not the super high-end one the best camera is the one you carry in your pocket that you actually use the best equipment is the stuff that you actually understand easily that you can hand over to someone else and say shoot this without them having to do a degree for that certain gadget so my equipment apart from my leica camera which i carry but that 
never leaves my hands. My equipment is relatively simple. I've got my phone. I've got a cell, uh, sort of a pro selfie stick. I've got a little little camera. I'm probably going to get another camera now, but it's nothing super fancy. It's just stuff that's easy to carry easy to use and that's not annoying to use because the moment it starts to get annoying you're not going to use it and do you have an online resource or a tool or a mobile app that you find invaluable to your life as a speaker now um no <laughs> <laughs> I have not found, I mean, obviously I'm using certain different apps. I have not found one where I would go, wow, that's an amazing app. For me, the most powerful one is, and sorry to, to sound so, so um, funny, it's WhatsApp because that I, I communicate with my team constantly via WhatsApp. Um, we share a lot of, lot of um, materials through WhatsApp. I don't have the one great um, app that helps me as a speaker unfortunately not and what about a book if you could recommend one book to our listeners it could be a book on speaking or it could be a book on the the topic that you're really know about which is this this uh, unleashing uh, unleashing people's potential um what would that book be good books that i've recently read um i really loved the book ted talks um very powerful one that inspired me at a very early stage of my speaking career um I, um, you know what, when we talk about books, one thing, one thing I think I want to, want to add here, a lot of speakers globally, um, have written books, some more substantial than others. But what, what I really, um, want to put a focus on is if as speakers, we have that urge of also being published. Can we please all try to just be published with substance? I've, I've been handed so many books that were slightly bigger than flyers, that were created in very little time. Um, and you, can, you, can, you take a book and you immediately see that this is sort of a book that was done in two, three weeks. I have the highest respect for quality. Ron Kaufman's um, Uplifting Service mm. is a New York Times bestseller. And it is a New York, New York Times bestseller because Ron knows what he's talking about. That book did not happen overnight. Um, so that's for, for me a big plea for the, in, in the speaker community. Let's all create more valuable content and not just publish books because it's one of the things you've got to do as a speaker. Yeah, sometimes that thing of just because you can doesn't mean that you should. <laughs> so so uh, in, terms yes, of, in terms of the quality, yes. you should because you can and still it, publish it, it, very cheaply doesn't mean you should publish. <laughs> yeah, and it, it might it might look no, look nice on your website to say, hey, I've got a book, but when people then hold it in their hands and it's twenty five pages out of which five are for comments, uh, with seventeen typos on the first three pages. It, it ruins your brand as a speaker. It totally ruins your brand as a speaker. Now let's imagine, uh, Sonia, you wake up tomorrow morning, wake up in- Well, I hope I do. Beautiful Singapore, or wherever you <laughs> would like to wake up in the morning. Okay, uh, but you I am on the 64th floor overlooking Marina Bay Sands. That's beautiful. where I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. That's a great view. Um, but you're gonna have to start from scratch. So now, no one knows you, you know no one, mm -hmm. But thankfully, you've got all the tools of your trade, all the knowledge you've acquired over the years. What would you do now? How would you restart things? Um, I would probably restart with an empty sheet of paper and a pen. Um, I would start um, putting down the strategic steps that I've undertaken those last two years. I would probably get a great team right from the start. Um, I would probably invest more into, well, not more, I would invest because I don't have that at the moment. In a, um, I would probably employ someone like you, um, someone who totally nails sales and, and online marketing. And I would just get the right team together and, and just start building it, um, building my speaking career with the same content, but a more competent team right from the beginning. Well, Sonia, thank you so much for coming on today to The Speaker's Life. If people want to connect with you, you. more about your speaker pro, speaking programs, the other things that you've got going on, where's the best place for them to go and do that? Probably www.zonyapiontech.com. And Zonya is spelled with a J, so sonjapiontech.com.
Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. And I wish you all the greatest success with your speaking. Likewise. Thank you so much, James. It's been an absolute pleasure.